Welcome to the Art of Precision on Gillette World Sport. Coming up today, we dive in for a lesson in breaststroke with Olympic medalist Josh Perneau. Serve up the tennis action from the Paris Masters. And rev up for a WRC test day. We weren't perfectly happy first thing, so we changed some things on the car and it seems to be working a lot better now. First on Gillette World Sport, we're USA bound for a lesson in breaststroke with Olympian Josh Perneau. I've kind of been swimming my whole life. My parents started me off with those baby swimming classes, and I just kept wanting to do more and more swim lessons. But the lessons ended, and they told me that I needed to join a team. So I did, and here we are now. Breaststroke is interesting because it's the stroke that has the most resistance, so you have to balance a number of things to be good at it. Things that you have to do well, body position. You want to be high in the water, but if you try and get yourself too high in the water at some point during your stroke, then you're going to sink low. So you have to figure out what's the best point to stay. You have to figure out tempo because, especially in the short pool, the underwater component is very important and it takes up more than half of the race sometimes. So if you have a long underwater component and a slow tempo, then you're not going to be breathing very much. You'll just burn all your oxygen and your fuel very quickly. You've also got to balance the resistance within the stroke. There's a fine line between trying to put yourself in a position where you can apply a lot of force to the water and kind of getting yourself caught where your arms are stuck or your legs are in a bad position and suddenly you're in a position where you're presenting a, a large frame to the water that's in front of you. So you want to be narrow and sort of slip through the water. It's hard to say whether there's an ideal physique for it because, you know, different people keep on breaking the world record. So it, it's an interesting stroke to watch and it's an interesting thing that I have to kind of figure out every day as I pursue getting better. There's a lot of different stuff you can do to, to make yourself better at swimming, specifically breaststroke. We swim with resistance. There's a lot of different ways you can add resistance to your body. You can pull on the power towers, that's where you fill up a bucket with water, bucks attached to a rope, ropes attached to your waist, and you can swim against that. That sort of helps you feel where there should be tension in the stroke as you're applying force to the water. Pretty much every Tuesday here at Cal, we do a pretty good speed-oriented practice where we'll go through probably an hour-long set where we'll go about five minutes, just super, super intense, all out. We want to be hitting race speed or almost race speed on that. And then we cool down, try and bring the heart rate down, try and recover for about 15 minutes. And then you get up and do it again, and you're trying to be consistent with the time. Josh is a very intense thinker, graduated with his degree in physics here from Cal. He's very fun to work with because you can talk to him in a very quantitative way about what he's doing, and that really resonates with him as an athlete. Josh's strength as an athlete is his strength to weight ratio. How he positions his body in the water is one of the best in the world. So he's creating very little resistance in how he's moving through the water comparative to the other world-class athletes that he's racing. When you're sort of a distance-oriented trainer like myself, it's pretty easy to not bulk up if you're really putting in the mileage, especially at this point in the season. If you're a swimmer, you're doing this motion thousands of times per day. So in the weight room, you want to balance that out so you're not getting injured and just so you're overall a strong athlete. I think that's something that especially younger swimmers are sort of notorious for is being great at swimming and then being terrible on land. I was definitely guilty of that myself. The gym training regimen that we have here at Berkeley has definitely helped a lot of us just become more athletic overall, which is going to help you get better in the pool. Becoming an Olympian was literally all I've ever wanted. And to work so hard towards that and see that finally come to fruition, not only with myself, but with some of my best friends, was 
absolutely an unreal experience, especially with uh, Michael Phelps's allegedly last games. You cannot ask for, for a better leader. As far as the actual meat of the Olympics, I would say that Olympic trials was far, far more stressful for me. It's just so high stakes, especially for me coming off of my senior year of NC2A swimming. It was sort of like, all right, if I win, I have a job. If I don't, then I really need to figure out what I'm doing with my life here. But then once I was on the team, surprisingly, it was very, very low pressure in Rio. I really was not swimming with nerves. Right before the Olympic final started, I kind of walked out, just looking up at the arena and just really trying to appreciate and savor that moment before I jumped in. Not hearing the anthem played is a bummer, but I mean, I, I really cannot ask for more than bring a medal to Team USA. My parents and girlfriend were in the stands. They were pretty close to the podium. So being able to step up there, look over and, and wave at some of the best people in my life was awesome. It's a little weird to sort of reset your goals. Being an Olympian was literally all I've ever dreamed of in this sport. So to, to come back at it and to be a professional athlete now, it's, it's a bit of a different experience. I really do enjoy the daily process of swimming, the struggle to, to find ways to keep improving yourself. So I'm, I'm gonna try to work really hard at that over the next four years. If I can have another Olympic experience in Tokyo, that would be amazing. It's always an honor to represent Team USA and to do it at the highest level is nothing short of incredible. Next, we're heading to the Accor Hotels Arena for a roundup of the action from this year's Rolex Paris Masters. The ninth and final ATP World Tour Masters 1000 event of the season saw players not only vying to win the prestigious title, but also hoping to clinch the remaining qualifying spots in the season-ending ATP finals. Celebrations came early for top seed Rafa Nadal after a second round win over South Korea's Hyun Chung ensured an unassailable lead for the 16-time Grand Slam champion, guaranteeing him the year-end world number one ranking. The Spaniard maintained his momentum to beat Uruguay's Pablo Cuevas for a place in the quarterfinals, but was then forced to withdraw due to a knee injury. This meant his quarter-final opponent, Serbian qualifier Filip Krajinovic, was awarded a walkover to the semi-finals, where he proceeded to cruise through to the final. Joining him would be American 16th seed Jack Sock in the first ATP World Tour matchup between the two 25-year-olds. Krajinovic took the early advantage, and despite Sock breaking back in Game 7, he went on to take the first set when his opponent netted a forehand. But the American soon found his rhythm. Having won the second set, his form continued into the third. Oh, what a shot from Jack Sock. Oh, my word! Even better. Fantastic. And after just under two hours on court, it was match point. Jack Sock wins the Rolex Paris Masters. The win moves Sock into the top ten for the first time in his career and secures him a spot in the ATP finals in London. Now we head behind the scenes with World Rally Championship driver Elvin Evans as he and the M Sport Racing team prepare to take on the recent Wales Rally GB. Rallying is where we, we take a car and we race against the clock on a range of different surfaces. So it could be tarmac, gravel, snow or ice. You're in control of your own destiny, as it were, in terms of results. You know, you're not uh, affected by what the others are doing around you. So. You have to concentrate on doing the best job you can do, and that's what I like about it. It's been a, a mixed year, um, some very strong performances. We've had two podium finishes, uh, but some difficult rallies as well. So hoping to, to round off the year on a, on a few highs now if we can. Tomorrow is our pre-event test for GB. 
Uh, we'll be testing up here in Cumbria, so it's near to the, to the factory. The roads are very similar to Wales, where the rally will be held. We build the car to a certain specification as far as we can before we test. And then once we've tested, we'll define the final specification for the rally, make the final changes, and then go to the event. Each event is different. We go down to transmissions, differentials, springs, suspension. Everything is varied in each event for different terrains, temperature, weather conditions. Today the car was a bare shell more or less this morning. We just got it back from doing a bit of welding work from the last Rally Spain because it's the same shell we used. I put the engine in today. One of my other guys concentrated on panel work and the third guy's on the interior. We, we kind of really know what the terrain's going to be like so we'll be down to more specification of the French where he feels he's getting better traction and that. So that will be the main focus on tomorrow. Then we will concentrate on ride heights and that to make sure the car isn't bottoming out and we get through the event safely. You can have drivers that can be a bit awkward, but with Elvin, he'll actually tell you the truth and be honest with you and you just do whatever you can to keep him happy. Our hopes of GB have to be very high, I think. Obviously, there's a little bit of pressure that people seem to think that come with that, but I enjoy it, to be honest. You know, we would really love to, to win our home event and... You know, we'll be doing everything we can to do that, but uh, a lot of things will have to go our way and it definitely won't be easy. This morning we started off with a base setup and uh, we tried to find the balance in the car that we were happy with. Um, we weren't perfectly happy first thing, so we changed some things on the car to, to change the balance of the car and it seems to be working a lot better now. Typical morning of testing really, uh, the car never really starts out exactly as you want it, but you have a plan and you try and work through that plan. Never easy to test in changeable conditions, um, obviously as it, as it rains and dries the surface grip changes, so you have to adjust the car to suit that, but uh, generally it's been a good morning and we're quite happy. Communication is the most important thing when you're testing. Uh, the primary source of information for us is from the driver, so it's the driver feedback. If we change something on the car, we, we kind of know what to, what to expect from his feedback, but we take his feedback, we look at the data, um, and then we decide what, what's the next thing to change. I think we're looking pretty good. Uh, we've got a, a tyre which seems to be working quite well in the conditions. Um, we've made uh, a, a good base setup now, so I think we're, we're looking, looking quite strong. Welcome to Teesside for the final stages of the 73rd Wales Rally GB. Home favourite Elfin Evans has held the overall lead since stage two and now has a shortly unassailable 53 second advantage over Thierry Neuville and Sebastian Ogier. It's a short day but to be fair the stages are still very very tricky today so uh, there's plenty to, to go for and we still need to be uh, on our best today. This has been all weekend. He's led virtually from the start. Elfin Evans about to become the first Welsh driver to win a round of the World Rally Championship. And he's done it in front of his home crowd. Yes! Yes! Well done, Elvin. Yes. It's been a good rally. Uh, I have to be very, very... Uh, very, very grateful for everybody you know who's, uh, who's stuck by me, you know, through uh, through all the years to, to get to this point. There's been a lot of people, uh, you know, who have, have supported me and backed me, and uh, yeah, this one's for them. Still to come, the season finale of the Superbike World Championship. And a behind-the-scenes look at the UCI's BMX Talent Detection Camp. Welcome back to Gillette World Sport. Coming up, we're discovering the next generation of BMX champions. And taking pole position for the finale of this year's World Superbikes. Now we're in Switzerland to look at how future BMX champions are being put through their paces at the UCI's World Cycling Center.
One of the newer Olympic disciplines, BMX racing has proven to be an exciting addition to the Games since making its debut in Beijing in 2008. At the UCI World Cycling Center in Switzerland, the sport's governing body is aiming to discover the next generation of Olympic hopefuls by inviting young riders from all over the world to take part in selection camps at the facility. There, coaches assess the athletes and choose only the most talented for further development. What we've got here is 27 riders from around the world who have come here as a, a talent ID camp. This is the third one, and the objective is to, is to select a team that will be the UCI BMX team. So the riders here start from 16 and go up to around 20 years old. With the three camps, I think we're probably looking at 15 riders in total. So there's quite a few riders to select from. I think the beauty of BMX, it's a very accessible sport. So you can be a kid you know, off the street, just gets a second hand BMX bike, go down the track and you can ride. We're predominantly working with countries that haven't got strong programs. So these are riders where there might be a small group in that country, they haven't got the facilities, the finances, they can't get to races out of that country. I mean, just here this weekend, we've got Latvia, Lithuania, Slovakia, Thailand, Ireland, Argentina, and we've got Russia. So they're from all over the world. So the World Cycling Center organized a talent identification program on the road, on the BMX, and on the track. Sports is a competitive environment, and for us, we judge the success on a number of medal Olympic champions. Uh, we have uh, Victoria Panletan, who actually passed here. We had uh, Guo Schwan, Daniel Tekelmainot, Chris Froome. We had Stephanie Hernandez get uh, third at the Olympic in uh, BMX. Jump, 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 jump. I really insist on the fact that we actually dealing like a school, like a university. We bring the athletes here for a period, can go from minimum from three months to a few years, but it's like a school. We develop them, educate and train them. And when they can go to the next level for us, it's a great success. It's not a training camp, it's a selection camp. So we're looking at the character, looking at the very skill on the bike, as well as giving them a, you know, a good time and a little bit of advice and direction of what they need to do. Think about that the next two times. We have a rider meeting at quarter past eight and tell them what's happening the day ahead. So this morning we did a sprint session, which was a lot of efforts, then lots of recovery. And we train from nine till 12, and then we have two hours off for lunch and then they're back at two o'clock till five o'clock. So we're actually doing like six hours a day. I mean, BMX, you go to the real, what we call core skills, just manuals, wheelies, bunny hops, cornering, you know, contact, which you can do, you know, a big thing at the moment is you can do that in a, in a car park or a playground, but then it's getting those skills and bringing them onto the BMX track and doing them at speed, you know, with other people around you. And obviously we're at the top of the eight meter hill here and the, the jump's are huge. Then you've got to do it with seven other people, banging your elbows, taking off, you know, and jumping. So it's massively skillful sport, and there's, there's so many areas to cover. Once we selected the team, I mean, obviously, what we want to try and do is get the guys to the Olympic Games. You know, a lot of them are quite young, so it could be a case of qualifying for Tokyo and really looking at maybe trying to get a medal, getting the finals at the Olympics in Paris. It's given them an opportunity to, to flourish, give them everything they need, the, the coaching, the tracks, the, the race um, experience and say, look, we'll give you all this, now let's see where you can go. Time now to look at the videos making the social headlines this week. George St. Pierre shared this clip of his workout with legendary trainer Freddie Roach before he returned from a near four year layoff to defeat Michael Bisping for the UFC middleweight title. Guard Marcus Smart impressed with this trick shot as the Boston Celtics continue their hot start to the new NBA season. Real Madrid shared this clip of goalkeeper Kiko Casillas' elaborate training drills. Lebanon prop Andrew Kazi pranked teammate Alex Twal as they began their Rugby League World Cup campaign in Australia. It was Gary Player's 82nd birthday this week and Golf Stars paid tribute to the Golf Hall of Famer by completing these 82-second planks. David Gonzalez combined his two favourite things, skateboarding and playing the guitar. Two-time X Games champion Oyston Braten landed this picture-perfect Switch 9. 
Double Olympic triathlon medalist Jonathan Brownlee took time out from his swimming training to explore this underwater reef. Extreme athlete Chris McDougall was going head over heels whilst paragliding in Turkey. And finally, the Houston Astros celebrated after they defeated the Los Angeles Dodgers to win baseball's World Series, their first in their 55-year history. Finally this week, we catch up with the best of the World Superbike action at the 13th and final round in Doha. Kawasaki's Jonathan Ray had blown the competition aside to take the 2017 crown with two rounds to spare. The final event of the year at the Losail International Circuit saw the Northern Irishman producing another masterclass in the Qatari desert. Getting away brilliantly from pole, he dominated the penultimate race of the season, pushing his Kawasaki to the limit over 17 laps to eventually cross the line five seconds ahead of Ducati's Chaz Davies, who was still bidding for the season's runner-up spot. After Raffaele De Rosa went down at turn nine whilst riding in the top ten and Alex Lowe's crashed at the last corner of the same lap when also in contention, the race one podium was eventually completed by Italy's Marco Melandri. The final race under the floodlights saw Chaz Davies making an incredible start as he shot from eighth on the grid to first within the first two corners. But on lap four, Jonathan Ray took control of the race. Welshman Davies survived a big wobble with perhaps the biggest save of the season but held his nerve to continue on the pace. Ray, however, was dominating once again. Jonathan Ray simply untouchable in 2017. Back on the top step of the podium. Your 2017 world champion, the triple world superbike champion. There's the championship helmet. Jonathan Ray does it again. His latest victory meant the triple world champion broke the record for most points in a single season at 556, as the Northern Irishman ends the year with 16 victories and 24 podiums in 2017. Chaz Davies securing the runner-up spot for the second time in his career.